Okay, so now we're back uh, in this video. We're actually going to try to pull real SharePoint data in order to populate the key contacts. Now, in the previous video, right before we ended, uh, I originally anticipated trying to pull just a JSON file and continue working in the workspace, localhost. But I, after putting this together, it only makes sense to actually start working with the real SharePoint data because most of the steps to take to pull from a JSON file are almost the exact same steps. I would say 97% of the same steps you need to pull the real data. So might as well just pull real data. Okay, so just to recap, this is what we're trying to build. And this is where we kind of left off. So we have uh, fake data. So we have a placeholder image. We have the name and then we have a title and we have a highlight. So, okay, and then a web part property title. So what we wanna do, let's go ahead and uh, actually pull some real data. So if we go back to the ABC photo site and we take a look at the list, I went ahead and created a list and the list is just uh, it's called key contacts. And this key contacts is a very simple list. It just has the title and it has the contact field. And if you want to add to one, the ideal is uh, for this particular project site, for new features, new feature requests, you need to contact Keelan at Maker. Okay. And then we don't need the attachment and then just save that here. And that's what this is supposed to be. So, you know, ideally you, what, what you want is even though uh, Keelan is the chief happy happiness officer, his company job title is not as important to respective to this particular project. If you need um, any help with any aspects of this project or key aspects of this project that you expose to the organization, these are the key contact folks that you want. And right here is a mixed bag. So, you know, we're acting like, okay, if we're in the HR site, you know, you contact Madison for benefits, so on and so forth. So what we want to do now is how do we pull this data uh, using the Office UI fabric for the persona component and the layout grid system uh, using React. So, okay, let's go ahead and get started. Now to pull this data, as you may or may not know, all we have to do is call the REST API uh, we will see what we get that i mean that's the starting point right so any natural say okay i want to pull this data let me see what i can get from the rest api so let's take a look at the json so in order to do that i'm already logged in i i used to use firefox and i use my trusty old rest client plugin which uh, to my understanding is only available in firefox and what we want to do is format this um REST API URL to pull that list data. So let's start with the URL to the list. I'm going to bring up Notepad. And basically all we need is underscore API forward slash web forward slash list get by title. And we want to put that as a function. And we just do the list name. Now this call is a little bit fragile, but I think out of all the other options, this is probably the best REST API call. And I say it's fragile in the sense that that display name, that get by title is the display name of the list. Okay, so now what this is returning is the XML. Let's change this to, to return JSON and the old data is gonna be verbose. Okay still return XML. There we go. JSON kicked in at that time. Okay. So if we scroll through here, basically what, what this is showing, this is giving me all the attributes to the list itself. It's not displaying any items. So we need to go ahead and add that piece to it. So let's go ahead and pop this guy open and then add in the items piece. Okay, now what do we have? So a lot of metadata, metadata. Okay, so now we're starting to get to the nitty gritty. So this is the HR benefits, contact ID, 
create the date, modify date, and more made up data, then it goes to the next one. So basically to represent the user uh, within the contact column, let me just go ahead and bring it up here in Firefox. Be a little easier to flip flop between them. So if to, so to bring up this user, so this is the contact field and basically what it's doing is just representing the user with this ID. Now, you, you may or may not remember this, but there is a, this ID is, is, is based on the user information list that is per site collection. And this is the ID of that user uh, in the user information list. It's not Active Directory, it's not the user profile, and this ID would change for the same user in different site collections. Just one of those tricky, nasty SharePoint isms when dealing with people. So in order to break this down, uh, I did some research and this is what I found. I found that you can use this expand, right, on the field based on the ID. And what that's going to do, that's going to give you information from, it's going to give you access to the various fields on that user information list, almost as if it's a lookup column to that user information list by ID. So let's take a look at the user information list, this, this mysterious user information list. And hopefully they don't get rid of this at SharePoint Online because it's actually a lifesaver. So if you take a look at the user information list, what you will find is, okay, what am I looking at here? Okay, wait, this is just the attributes for the list. So we have to do forward slash items. And this is a hidden list. And you can actually get to the URL. Um, I used to just do a Google search, Google, let me see, SharePoint user information hidden lists. And there's a lot of blogs out there that will give you the secret URL on how you can get to it. And basically because it's underscore catalogs, you can access this from any web within the site collection. And now if I go to, just so we can take a quick look at what's available, let me open this in a new tab and then modify this URL for catalogs. Okay, so this is this is the hidden list. And basically every time the user authenticates or visit the site, they get dropped into this list. And I believe you have to visit the site at least once in order to get popped in here. So if everyone in your active directory would not would not, will not um automatically be added to this. I think they actually have to visit any site list or library within that site collection. I believe that's how it works. I, I, I just, a few years ago, just work, remember working on something with people in groups and was just flabbergasted on. Sometimes it worked and sometimes it didn't. And then this was, I think that was the scenario. But anyway, so obviously everything we need from this list is not displayed. All the information that this list provides is not displayed here. Uh, so let's take a look at and see exactly what this list provides. So now I'm on the user information list. Did I add items? Let me add items to the end of this. And then click send. Okay, so now we're going to get a mixed bag of a lot of stuff. So let, let me do a quick find on Madison. Okay, so here's an example of Madison Wilcox. And here, as you can see, we can get the network ID, her email address, the SIP address, which is the AD key, um, profile pick, really almost everything that we need is going to be in this list. Now, there's a couple ways that we can tackle this. The first thing you can do is that we can do a REST API against this list and then just do like a join or a link query or some type of, you know, inner join, you know, using JavaScript, which is nasty, uh, by this ID. And this ID here should coincide with the ID we just saw. So I think one of those IDs was 55. Let me see. 
55 seems like a high number, doesn't it? Uh, hold on, let's do this. Let's do a search on this ID. I think Kilo Hype Maker was 55, if I was not mistaken. Benjamin. Okay, so so that so that I, that contact ID number that we received when we pull from the key contacts JSON coincides with this user information list here. So you know, obviously we can do a REST API call against user information and bring this up. So that's one way to do it. The other way, and this is kind of like the not so publicized way, is that you can do an expand. Uh, this really starts to feel, because this is exactly what you would do for a lookup field. So you can do an expand, and it's not necessarily projected columns, because even the columns that you don't flag as projected, you have access to. So if we look at the, so ideally, I should have access to all of these columns here. And if I run this query, and as you can see, what I'm doing is just, it's just a contact, a field name, forward slash, and then the sub property or the projected column that you want to bring back. And if I grab this guy, oh, let me scroll over to the top because that's a very long list. Click send. Now what it's bringing back is what a little bit what we've seen before. So that's 55 and now it's bringing back more details so as Benjamin, the first name, last name, title, work, all this other good stuff. Now, if we go back to the list, let me just say this in my favorites and then go back to that list. Ooh. I can't see anything. That user information. No, that no, was key context query. Uh, uh, let me go here. Let me just grab it from here. So if I do a s query against this endpoint, the user information list, you will see, let me, hold on, let me hit 55 again, that I have picture and then I have description. So here I, it seems like I have to go two levels and it will look something like this. I'm going to tell you right off, this is, this is not going to work. So picture, and then if I can get like description, that would give me the URL to the photo. And that's actually the last piece that we need um, based on our prototype and the information that we need to pull. But I can't get access here. It actually throws an error when I try this query. Even throws an error if I just do this right here with, you know, just picture without description, which which would not be helpful at all, but it would just throw an error. So where does that leaves us? So basically what we're going to do, we're going to split it up in half. We're going to pull the information that we have from the user information yes, using the expanded, you know, to get the projected columns. And then what we're going to do, we're going to do another process just to get the profile pick. And then we're going to try to make that as efficient as possible. Now, uh, spoiler alert, as far as like getting a profile pick, we're not going to do that in this video. Uh, that's going to be uh, the next video, but we're going to basically get most of our, you know, our project working with REST API data and going through that process with the S uh, SharePoint uh, development framework. So let's go ahead and get started. So let's just save that here. Let's pop into our project and see where we exactly left off. Okay, so here we have the web part, and then we have this container uh, component. We're going to call this the container component. Usually they say that's your parent component where it does all the uh, data retrieval, the data access stuff, and then it passes it to the child components using uh, the property bag for that component. And for, so, for, so this is our, this is going to be our container component. And we only have one child component, and that's called contact cards. And this is all hard-coded stuff, right? So let's do this. Let's go ahead and first off, let's clean up some HTML. So let's just do a single div container here. 
right just to clean things up uh, let's X that out here and let's get rid of all this stuff so let's get rid of all the out of the box markup oops okay so that's looking good so it's nice and clean let's make sure we didn't break anything so let's go back to okay so this is still running we got rid of the the header or the title for the web part we will actually let the contact card handle that so uh, as an example of how we're going to feed information to the shell component is that we're going to create these properties which are just going to which look like attributes on the tag and we're going to pass it information so in this case let's just do this dot props dot description right and you may be asking okay where do you where did you get description from so description is coming from um, the initial web part so as soon as you fire up a react template or project project file or yeoman template what it's doing is take the web part description so it gives you that web part and then it binds it to your container component for that particular project. Description in our case is going to be a little bit odd, but let's not let's not handle that now. Let's let's just go ahead and get this wired up. So what we want to do is make sure that we can pass in a wet part property down to our container component and then pass it to our child component so it can display the name of the wet part right above the contact card. So what I'm going to do, let's go inside this row here and let's do an H2 tag for our title. Okay. And then to bring this guy in, if you remember from the tic-tac-toe game, this is simply this dot props and whatever we named the attribute. So in, the, in our case, it's Heather, right? So if I highlight this, scroll down, yep, Heather, so that's all lined up. Okay, so let's save this all, test it out, make sure everything's working as expected. So this is refresh, many contacts, and that should be a direct reflection of this guy here, which it is. Okay, so that's working, all right? Um, description is probably a little bit too heavy for what we really want to do. So let's go ahead and rename that uh, appropriately. So let's rename this to title. So right now what we're doing, we affect and we're just renaming the wet part property. And instead of using the lo locale string, we're just going to hard code, code this title, right? Um, and then we have to lot of cleanup. So first we have to go to the wet part property where this is defined. Let's just change that to title. And then if we go here, this should be a Rick squiggly because it's no longer description, title. And then for a component, now, you know, is what we're doing, we're passing in a property interface to represent all the properties for our, our container component. So let's just modify that. And that's gonna be this guy here. Let's rename, it, rename this to title. And then we get to the web part, rename this to title. Right. I'm sitting in the kitchen by the dishwasher, so just in case you hear running water, I promise you I'm not doing this in the shower. Okay, so where are we? Okay, so in our component, we renamed everything title, and then we just renamed this title, and then actually the refactory stops there, right? Because we're using Heather, and these are loosely coupled, so all of our refactoring should be done. Save it off. It didn't refresh. There must be an error. Okay. Oh, there's one more guy in the manifest. This is where you set the default value. So many contacts. Eh, let's just do many contacts WP. That's going to be our default title. Save this all. Let's go back to our console app. Still, it's not liking it. Oh, we have some unsaved, unsaved changes here. That's the solid circle. All right, so let's just go hit a file, save as, make sure we, oops, save all, not as. Okay, save all. All 
All right, so all our files should be hit now. Okay, their register is updated. And then the web part. Interesting that it got wiped out, right? Uh, okay, let's just say key contacts. All right, so that's still wired up. And then if you add in another one, it's going to be blank. And that's only because um, when you start messing around with the JSON config files, you actually have to stop the GOAT process. So I'm going to do a control C. Yep, stop it. And then just restart it right back up. And it should get us going. Is it going to pop up in a new tab? Yeah, I think it's going to pop up in a new tab. So let's kill this one. All right, so we add it in, and that's our default value there. Add in another one, default value. Change it to key contacts. And now it starts to feel like any other SharePoint web part to where you can control the title and you can control now that we're doing the custom web part where it displays. Okay, all right, so that's good. So that's really going to be the basis of our model. So now what we want to do, this guy keeps popping up. Now what we want to do is let's bring in some real data, okay? Uh, okay, so let's go into our container component. And like I said before, this guy is going to be responsible for grabbing all of the REST API data that's needed for all the child components that it, it is hosting. So this is one pattern I noticed, and I, and I actually kind of like it where anytime that we do a private function that goes below your render method, right? And if you want to do anything public or a constructor uh, or any overriding events, those should go above. So your render method should be the, the break point between what's private and what's exposed, right? So let's just do this private method and let's just call this get contacts. And I really like the fact that, you know, because it's private, we do the underscore. That's some old school C++ for you. Okay, so let's do uh, get contacts. And basically what this is going to do is, you know what, this should be our business class, our business method. So everything that we need as far as the URI information for the rest endpoint should reside here in our business class. Right, so let's just grab this guy here. This is the URL for our REST API, and then paste that in. You want to use quotes. Let me go home here, make this a string. And yep, I'm doing a lot of hard coding, right? So I'm hard coding the, the tenant uh, uh, root root domain or the root URL for the tenant. So I, I am hard coding that for now. You know, we can fix that later. It's not a big deal. Okay, so this is going to do our REST API, um, our endpoint. And now what we're going to do is we need to bring in some helper methods to actually uh, make a REST API call within SharePoint. And for that, I'm going to just save you some time by copy and pasting some stuff that already works. Okay, so basically, this is to get context. This is going to be a business layer. And this get SP data is just, excuse me, it's going to be a generic get call to SharePoint, right, for any SharePoint REST API. It doesn't care what the, your, the endpoint URL is going to be. This will always return the JSON as a string, right? And that's by, that's on purpose. And then we'll talk about that in a second. So let me just copy this over to our project and paste this guy in, right? So we're gonna bring this in as his own guy. And what it's doing is that the way I had this configured is that it's expecting the HTTP client and I actually pass that in. All right, so let's go ahead and set this up. So I'm passing this as a property to my container component. So let's go into the container component for props and let's create one called a property called client and this should be a um, let's go back to the project this should be a s sp HTTP type interface 
our class. So let's go ahead and grab that. And these are going to be imported here at the top. Okay, so let's grab this. Let's copy this. Let's bounce over back over here into our props. And it took me a minute to figure this pieces, these pieces out. Uh, a lot of a lot of this stuff I extracted from samples from the SharePoint development framework. Uh, so if you do a Google search on SPFX sample GitHub, that will land you into the library of samples. Just beware. I, I think some of those samples are pretty heavy. I, I think some of the things that they do, what you know, uh, using uh, Redux, which is a framework for calling, making Ajax call, use you know with React and, and state management. Uh, some of those do uh, use leverage as that framework. Other ones do a very uh, like a data provider or service provider type model to where they actually extract uh, the data provider and then pass that in as a repo or a service layer. Uh, and all of that is, is super sweet. I mean, it's, you know, and obviously, you know, it's almost like that dependency injection. It's like, you know, you definitely want to make sure you cover. But I think for a lot of the stuff that we do, uh, a lot of that stuff is just so heavy handed. I mean, I don't need a, a data provider or the flexibility of a data provider class or a separate layer uh, in the event that my contacts, instead of pulling from the REST API out of the box SharePoint at REST API to a SQL data source, right? I, I, I just don't need that flexibility. I think, you know, I just want to keep these simple. And if that requirement presents itself to where it's like, yeah, this needs to be flexible to account for any data source, right, with minimal changes. And then, you know, we are, we are put in that level, what I would consider like a level seven, level eight uh, complexity within our project. But I think for what we're doing, I say let's keep it minimum. And I worked very hard and looked at many different examples and pieced things together until I was comfortable and happy with the turnout. And I think I'm really happy with this model. I think this is a very repeatable model and I think it's a very supportable model. Okay, enough of that. So this HTTP client, so basically what we're doing, we're telling our, our container component, let's say, hey, here's a client and we want our web part to pass in the client, right? Because we really don't want our container component to be bringing in or importing in the web part type classes, right? That's what, that's web part stuff, right? And, uh, and I guess what I'm referring to is this stuff here, right? That's all, you know, that base side web part, the properly configured, that's all web part stuff. Let's, let's keep that separate from our container component. Our container component just give us enough of what we need to do to get the data. And then from there, we're just dealing with pure, you know, TypeScript, ES5, ES6, whatever, React, boom, 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 really nothing SharePoint other than the type of data return. And I think that's a really good separation of concerns. Okay, so in order to pass that in, I actually need to go back and paste this guy one more time. I think it's saved on my clipboard. Uh, let me paste in, no, hold on. Let me wait to paste that in. I don't think I need that. So now uh, we have client, right? And basically we want this dot context and the SP HTTP. And now from previous video, this is so confusing. And this was a breaking change, I think right at the release candidate. Before all of the, uh, uh, SharePoint Prime client information was called HTTP client, and then there was a basic HTTP client for any other REST API calls that were outside of SharePoint, right? They switched that. So they, they, they use HTTP client to represent the basic stuff that does not going to have the digest, the headers, and all that stuff needed for SharePoint, get post, and especially post and merge and put merge type calls or delete calls. Um, they put all that stuff here, which is cool, right? Because it's explicit, especially in that view when you're looking at um, the different clients in, in, in one drop down. Okay, so now we're just going to pass in the HTTP client. That's going to uh, allow our, our guy to call. Uh, so now uh, in our container component, we have to bring in that same library or module. Right, and basically this is the client that's needed to make the call. 
this is con this configuration component. I think they're priming this for future reference because it's always V1, and the only option is V1. So there may be a V2 or something like that coming down the pipe. And then um, the response this is for the JSON that gets returned. So now if we look at this, okay, so now this is all happy. If we look at this, this get basically what it's doing is just has to describe. It gets the client, it calls the get method. The URI of whatever you pass in, it doesn't care. It's a get SharePoint call. Um, this configuration component, and then it does the response, and then the HTTP response, and does the JSON. And this guy here is something that I picked up from a sample. And I really like this model because in the previous examples when we were making SharePoint REST API calls within the SharePoint development framework, all of our callers had to do this dot value to get to the real JSON data. Um, so, so doing all that dot value here, now they're just dealing with the data. They don't have to um, do any um, dig deep to, to get access to the, to the information. Now, the one thing that I'm changing here is the promise. Ideally, they want to do an interface to make all this type safe. We're still going to make a type safe, but we're just going to do it later in the process. Because this guy needs to be reusable, of course, we can call a template class and then have it morph or adjust the JSON for that. But I think that's kind of heavy, especially when you start considering the maintenance uh, for this. So, you know, if we start typing here, and any time that we want to add a column, you know, we have to make sure that everywhere the type is used, that new property is assessed, unless it's just, you know, um, passed through. So, and, and basically, that's what we want this for. We want this to be so generic, and we want it to be passed through. We're not touching the details of the collection. We want to get the collection. Uh, this business logic here defines what we need to get from the JSON as a collection and then it's just going to return it guys so let's go ahead and do that um so this should be hold on let me let me copy and paste because i tried this so many different ways and i am kind of forgetting which way did i settle on this um okay so i am setting the state here so this is doing a little bit more than what i originally anticipated so let's go ahead and paste this guy in just for the sake of argument, because this video is getting long. Um, let's just paste this guy in. And this is going to be our business layer. And now it's going to say, hey, I'm doing some stuff that you haven't defined yet. Okay, so the first thing we have to do is set up the state. So we kind of, and then I apologize for this. I, normally, I would type all of this out manually. Uh, I, I just need a little bit more practice to make sure I get the syntax and I just don't want to waste this video for you uh, watching me fumble um, and trying to get my curly brackets and uh, parentheses right. Okay, so in order to, so basically what this is going to do, this is calling SharePoint data. It's going to get to JSON. I did some logging here because stuff wasn't working, so I had to turn on my headlights. And then once it gets to JSON, it needs to set the, the property bag or the state bag for our container component. Now, in order to get a state bag going, let's get above the render. We have to do a constructor, right? And then and anytime you call a constructor, you must explicitly call the base class constructor. So that's your super. And then you just do a this state and you set the state object. And we just do something, something like this. And now I'm kind of normally you can name this whatever you want. I named it contacts and I'm going to just set this to a array. Okay. Now this red squiggly here. Now this is something to be aware of. Uh, I finally figured out what these guys do, right? Remember I was saying, Hey, I'm blindly following this model. When I go to the react tutorial, it always has any, any, but when I fire up the SharePoint, you know, it got stuff there. It has a void, it has a properties, uh, interface or collection. Uh, so that's so that's exactly what this is. So this guy, in our case, when we define our component, we do an any, any. The first one is for the properties of that component. The second one is for the state bag or the state of that component. And right here, it says void. It says this should be a stateless component, but we're actually going to make it a component that uh, that's going to be modifying state. So ideally, what we should do 
it's an any child component and you want to minimize the number of you know, again this is back going back to the tic-tac-toe video what we talked about when I was reading up on react I followed the tutorial and then one of the patterns that they said was hey designate a parent component to do all your data calls and manipulation and then just pass the data down to your children and minimize the number of uh, components that you have that's modifying the state it's just a performance thing and an angular has the same issue with the digest right any change it does a redigest and it checks all these um, uh, dom elements right to see what change what change because it's storing that internal state tracking the changes and every time you make a change it, they said that was one of the, the least performing things about angular so a big thing about that so let's not let's not use the or trigger any internal digest where not where it's not needed. So if we're not using the state, let's just go ahead and uh, flag it as a full weight. And then that way, if you accidentally get in there and start playing around with state, you get the red squiggly. That should be a pause mom that says, "Hey, originally I wanted this to be stateless. Why, you know, what scenario am I working in that's requiring me to define a state?" Okay. So here we want to say any. Uh, in any mini set, these states are, are would not have are not going to be type safe. We're not going to force a type on them, which is another thing that you can do. And that's what they're doing here. Um, and I think that's what the any does. I may be wrong about that, but I think it's starting to come together for me just a little bit. All right. So anyway, so here's our contacts. So now uh, once we get the JSON data, let's comment this out. I don't think we need headlights yet. Uh, once we comment that out, well, we set the data to the state. Uh, and now what we can do let's pass this guy to uh, the child component now I'm telling you it took me a while to figure this out and I tried many different things and watched uh, several different videos uh, on how you know just pure react folks outside of SharePoint right um, and how they were doing it and you you really need this I'm sorry I can't talk in code at the same time uh, this dot state dot contacts right you really need to state uh, the state back. I tried to do this with a property and it didn't work. It actually didn't fire. And what's happening is because you're dealing with a promise. And it seems like the state is the only mechanism between the two properties and state that um, when, even if you send it was a problem, like when this renders, it's going to try to render this. this uh, it's really going to try to pass. It will pass this empty contacts collection it's going to be empty right until the data comes back and then it's going to get hydrated with the you know with the promise um props did not did not once it hydrated props did not update so i wasn't seeing anything it was only until i started to use the state that i actually started to get the the expected results so that's one thing to keep in mind so if you need to pass data and it's a, and it's a promise um you probably are forced to use a state property bag versus a state bag versus a property bag. I, I don't know the right term to quickly identify those. Okay, so that's that. So that's context. So now we set that to items. So now we can go to our child component. Okay, let's clean this up before we try to render anything. Let's clean this up. Let's just get one. Let's get this down to one instance. All right, so let's do this. And all right, something's not happy. What's I'm missing a deal. Did I delete too many? Oh yeah, you deleted the column. All right, so there. All right, so now we're happy with divs. Okay, so basically to get this to work, it, it actually turned out a lot simpler than I ant originally anticipated. Because I was doing like render row, I was firing up all these other methods and stuff like that. It's actually really, really simple. And again, this is the value of looking at different examples for pure React, uh, just so that you can kind of get engulfed in that community. And that's true for any framework that you use. So if you're dealing with SharePoint development framework with um, Angular, get into the Angular community. Look at a lot of Angular examples. The problem with that is, is that they ignored the SharePoint stuff, which I think is fine. Right. Because, you know, once you get down to the JSON piece of SharePoint, it should start to feel like any other um, uh, modern stack uh, framework or modern stack solution. Um, but, yeah, there's a lot of golden nuggets when you look at pure React 
tutorials on YouTube, our Plur site, or even the React uh, GitHub site, or training and all the other good stuff. You get some really, really cool tricks and tips on how to deal with these common scenarios. So this is a common scenario. A common scenario is, hey, I've got properties uh, collection, right? I need to iterate through that like a for each loop um, and then get all the items out and start building my HTML dynamically. And in order to do that, uh, just items, oh, no, I'm going to screw this up, dot map. And then I'll just, just call this contact parenthesis. Remember, this is J, uh, this is JSX, right? We're in the render method. There are no semicolons in JSX. Okay. Uh, uh, do I have all my curly brackets right? This is what I was trying to. Oh, this is what I was trying to protect you from me, fat fingering or trying to stumble across this. Okay, I think I got this right. So now, uh, what what we want to do is put this guy here inside of this uh, shift O F. All right. So inside of this loop, right? So basically this map, and this is uh, just in the array, right? This is nothing fancy. Uh, it maps the array and it's gonna define each item in that array to this object here, contact. And once you have that, if we do this correctly, we should simply be able to go another set of curly brackets and I'm gonna just do title for now, okay? Whoa, where's job title coming in? Why is this thing acting like I have a model for it? Okay. Maybe it's just Visual Studio being Visual Studio. All right. So now if we save this, two things we're going to learn. The first thing is we have a compile error, so we didn't do something right. Client does not exist on many props. Oh, Deshaun Clark. Does exist on many props. What do you mean? <sighs> okay, where did we go wrong? If you see it, say something. Don't let me struggle by myself. Okay. Property client does not exist on the type many props. Oh, dang. Save all you every time do this is going to compile okay I can't believe that all right so that compile but it's not going to render right so I expected this right because we're dealing with rest API and rest API means nothing and it's local host environment so now we have to do the cool trick and Microsoft was really really cool with this and this is and I heard that this is an example from dog fooding so basically, um, because the SharePoint engineering group uses the exact same REST API calls and tooling that we as uh, clients use or client you know, developers use, uh, they came up with these cool workarounds and shortcuts. And one of the workarounds and shortcuts was the ability to render your workbench within the SharePoint tenant without having to manually deploy the web part. And in order to do that, uh, prior to the release candidate, we had to jump through a lot of hoops with uploading a file to a document library, adding a client application column, and blah, 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 blah. Now, all we have to simply do for any web that you want to get access to is data using REST API within your workbench is just do underscore layout 15, right? That's where all the app files are. And then workbench ASPX, not HTML. Localhost is using HTML, but when you're in the tenant, you're using ASPX. You hit enter, and this is magic. It's magically uh, recognizing your Node.js and your localhost and the port that it's running on, right? And surfacing your web part. So we go into many contacts. This is our web part, and then now it's available. And that still didn't fix it. Okay, so now we get to troubleshoot. So the first thing we want to do is look at the console. All hints are in the console. Okay. Get client side web parts. 
what? Oh. No, that's an internal thing. No, don't don't go in there. Don't go in there. I thought the fat finger, because that kind of looked like the call we were making. Okay, so hit refresh. Oh, I know exactly what the problem is. Ignore the Office Suite stuff. If anything says Outlook, that's just, I think they have a new contact card that uses Outlook or the Graph API, and it's just throwing all kind of errors, so ignore that. I know exactly what the problem is, and it's funny because I made this exact same mistake when I was working with it before. So we got our business method that's calling our data layer or data service method, right? But nowhere are we calling the business method, right? So we need the constructor to establish the state. Initially, what I tried to do was call the get contacts in the constructor, and that did not work. I think it was calling it too early. So I was calling the data, and it was setting the property but this guy was not ready for it. So again, another React nugget that I found was uh, there is an overwrite method called component, and you're not going to get IntelliSense for this, did mount, capital D, all camel case, right? Capital D, capital M. And you call this guy, and basically this is the guy that calls the business method get contacts and then save it all right so now we're fired up we're over here let's get rid of this uh, you're not going to get an uh, other refresh here when you're in the tenant so you have to manually refresh it I know pain in the butt uh, let's go ahead and inspect console okay address not found okay here's a call so what happened um, ignore that. Dude, I'm, I'm making the exact same mistakes as before. Um, Alright, um, I hate, I hate cheating, right? Because these are learning moments. Okay, let's give it 30 seconds. Can we figure out what's going on here? All right, so I'm calling get contacts. I'm calling, oh, okay, so I got contacts. Did I spell it right? And that's the thing, like most of with all this TypeScript stuff, usually if something doesn't work, it's a typo. Uh, it's really nothing more than that. Uh, so this is good. And the question is, yep, I, do I, I make the same mistakes over and over. Let's see. It's incredible. I'm, I'm learning nothing. The problem is, is that when you call this this map guy, it does something weird. That uh, yeah, you do the fat arrow notation for the function, but this has a return method very similar to JSX, almost like it's internal JSX, and whatever you're outputting must be wrapped into that return method. Right, very similar. Oh, yeah. So return method and the return cannot be on the line by itself. I don't know. I mean, this small little stuff right here drove me crazy because I mean, looking at syntax, you know, what is, is absolutely right. But you know, I promise you, if you put this on this line, you get a red squiggly. And I'm like, what am I missing? I'm missing a curly bracket. Or I'm missing a what? It's just no, you're not missing anything. You just Put the parentheses on the same line as the return. All right, hit say, go back, hit refresh. Boom. 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 Wow, this is a beautiful thing. All right, so now I have data. This is, these are not exactly names, right? And then AL is being hard coded because that's something we're setting. So let's go ahead and pull real data from that JSON that we got. So this number here just means that, hey, you got JSON and then you have eight, seven items, four and three, seven. Uh, but you're not really pulling any real data other than the title because it was easy to get. Okay, so let's look at our JSON one more time to see how we should be formatted. Uh, is this JSON? Which, 
no, this doesn't look like this is user information list. Okay, so let's pop down to this loan guy. All right, so we should be formatted. So what we're going to do, let's go ahead and make this type safe. All right, so what we can do, let's let's do let's do one thing first. Let's just pull contact dot title. That's going to give you the first and last name in one field, which is good. Uh, so let's do that. Um, let's get rid of this. We don't want to overwrite the initials. We want the initials to be derived from the primary text name. All right. So because I call it, let's just call this item, right? So because we're already going to be using the keyword contact as a property. So item dot contact dot, uh, title, right? And this should give us her name. And then so software engineer being hard coded. Let's do item dot title. This is the this is the overridden job title or job function or the contact right. So HR benefits, even though their job title is chief happiness officer or something, for example. Right. And that guy should be this guy here. Right. So this is coming off our list. This is our people group field, and then based on the projected fields, this is what we get, right? And this right here is their job title that's in the user information list. This is the one that we override and say, hey, for key contacts for marketing brochures, contact Benjamin. Okay. All right, so let's go ahead and save this all. And minimize this. Let's open up. Refresh. I'm watching this window here. Make sure we don't get any compile errors. And there we go. So there's Madison. There's the Sean. There's the override title. And the only other thing we have to add in is the phone number. So let's go back here. Optional text. This is hard coded now. And again, this will not show up until we adjust some. Until we adjust some uh, CSS. So phone number, let's make sure I get this right. Phone number should be work phone under contact. And again, you see I have to copy and paste this because I have no real IntelliSense because these are not type safe. So I paste that in there. All right, save this all. And then hit refresh. All right, and then if you look into this, the rendering, the phone number there, so it's not displayed. Let's just highlight this line here. Let's uncheck display none, and then phone number starts popping in and start overlapping. All right, two more things, and we're going to wrap this up. I know this video is becoming super, super long. Thank you for hanging in there. Um, two things we want to do. First, I talked about hey, we're not going to type safe this because we want this to be as generic as possible and we're not going to use template classes because we want to minimize the maintenance on this for future, uh, future use, right? But we do, I mean, there is definitely advantages of type safe in it, uh, you know, using TypeScript. So let's do that inside the component. And I think it makes sense to do this inside of the component anyway because the component is the one that will be accessing the properties. So that's it's the one that really take advantage of it. So let's do this. Let's let's define. Oh, here we go. I opened the wrong project, didn't I? Yes, you did. All right. So let's do this. Let's just copy this. And basically what it's doing is say, OK, for the contact, you have title and contact. Those are two fields. But in order to get to the sub properties, you got to do another interface to define that type. And these are the ones that are in the projective columns, right? So let's minimize this. And let's just define this here. And in the next video, what we're going to do, we're going to move all these into their separate files, clean this up a lot, and really make sure that we have the clear separation of concerns. All right, so here's our eye contact. Now, in order to type this, all you have to do in this map property, which is a super sweet thing, 
you can tell it. So for each item that you pull out, cast it to this guy. Right? And once you do that, item dot context dot there you go. And now you don't have to re reference the JSON all the time. But we put a maintenance, another maintenance step in there because every time we add a column, right, if we want to bring in another column from the JSON, we would have to update the interface for that. But all of our changes should be contained here um, or in the other child, uh, child component that may be leveraging that. Okay, so that's that. The second thing we want to do is, oh, let's just make sure it works. Go here, menu refresh. Uh oh, not good. Oh, oh, okay. It just took a while. No, say so do. I just added interface. Okay, so that's good. All right, so let's adjust the columns. How many we try to squeeze into a row before we start to wrap? Instead of doing four, let's do three. And to change that, all we have to do is just change our column element here to four. Yeah. To get three to display, you, each one must take up four spaces. All right, there we go. A little bit more readable. All right. And now if we add in another one, we're good. Okay, so now because these are web, part pro, uh, web parts, let's leverage properties um, to really start to bring in additional data. And that's where we're going to pick up in the next video. So in the next video, we want to use properties to say, okay, there is a bunch of lists and libraries within the site. Which one holds your contact information? And then they're going to, so we can specify the name there. Then we can use the slider property, right, to specify how many of these to display, right? Um, so we can get that going. And then we'll play around with some CSS and hopefully um, get this cleaned up. The phone number there is not displayed, so let's overwrite and get that cleaned up. Uh, there seems to be some spacing issues um, and all this other good stuff. So I think once we get that, get those pieces rolling. I think we should be, oh, and then most importantly, most importantly, most importantly, we need to get the profile picture. Again, the profile image is not part of the user pro, well, it is part of the user profile. It's part of the user information list, but we couldn't get access to it because when we did projected properties on picture, it throws an error. It throws a, a REST API error. Um, so yeah, so we have to do an alternative method to do that. And hopefully the pattern, the minimal, minimalist pattern that we're trying to include, especially when we start to separate the stuff out, this code should be really clean and easy to follow and not that many layers, right? And that's another thing. I think it'd be added complexity when you're chasing here and there's another file and you're chasing down there and you get another file and it has two methods in it or one class with two properties. I mean, we're just creating files for the sake of creating files. I mean, you can separate the concerns without creating a file for each one of those, especially for simple web parts. And I think, you know, as we, you know, as we work along here, and I may be wrong, I may be wrong, but part of me says that, hey, these are very simple web parts. We want to keep them easy to maintain. Uh, and uh, the way this these projects are set up, you can have more than one web part in the project. And I think that's where we may get some friction or some static that says, okay, maybe you need to elevate certain pieces of this for reusability across web parts. But, you know, until until we hit that, we are designed for that. But for, I would say, 85% of the requirement, especially from the web parts that I created in the past, um, were most displaying data. Very few, I would say only like 10% of them actually created or updated data, right, with the delete and all this other good stuff. So I'm sure our pattern probably have to change a little bit, but, you know, what, might as well keep it simple for the 85%, right, where I have a level of complexity 
that you probably would never leverage. And I think that's how I'm kind of going into this. Um, and then, you know, I could be wrong. You know, it's, it's one of those things where I, I may be wrong and I may have to come back and say, you know what, let's put in a provider level. Let's, you know, let's typeface everything from the time that you grab it and all this other stuff. But I don't know. To me, I think this is more simple. This is easy to understand and easy to follow, especially once we start to separate these things out. And it should be a much uh, repeatable pattern. And we can just focus on the UI and the other business logic. All right. So that's it for this video. Um, catch you on the next one where we actually work more and get this thing buttoned up. Take care.